All right. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear us. Uh, welcome to the second webinar in our June webinar series. I'm Darren Fons, the project manager here at the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm Natalie Steinfeld Childrey, Publications Manager of Coral. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the practice of adapting, teaching, and creating OER for use in language teaching. Uh, right, we're just going to have a video today, or excuse me, audio today, so no video. Um, we're happy to have you with us today. Two st we have uh, three stellar foreign language teachers uh, here today with us who are going to share their experiences with teaching and creating OER. First, we have Amanda DeLola, who uses uh, Francais Interactif in her classroom. We also have uh, Dr. Orlando Kelm with us, who's a, an adopter and creator of OER in Spanish and Portuguese. And we're also joined by Carl Blythe, the director of the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. So we're really excited to have all of them here today. Uh, so um, we're unfortunately also to have, uh, unfortunately we couldn't have Stephanie here today uh, due to some technical issues, but she uh, may be in the chat room with us today. So, um, but before we do that, we're going to take care of just a few uh, logistics. Last week, we heard from a number of you that you had audio issues. Um, so to help alleviate this, we have been playing some CC license music for all of you, courtesy of Jamendo. Um, the session will be recorded and made available on our website after this session. Yeah, and so just a quick uh, few reminders. Uh, we encourage you to make this session interactive. So on the left, or actually above, you'll see that there's a questions column. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions as the presentation goes along, and we'll do our best to monitor that uh, questions pod and respond to your questions as they come in. So if you're going to be tweeting today, uh, we ask that you're going to use the hashtag Coral. If you get kicked out for some reason, please log in under the same name as before so we can keep track who's here. Finally, Many of you who are joining us today have already indicated your desire to receive CME or CPA, uh, CPE credit for participating in today's session. For those of you who haven't yet submitted the request for CPE credit, please follow the link in the info section that appears on the left-hand part of the screen and fill out this information. It is, it is a Google form, so be aware that if your school blocks access to the site, you will have to fill it out later. You can also send a note to info at coral.utexas.edu. We will find you and make sure you get a certificate for attending. All right, so it doesn't look like there's any questions so far, but and hopefully people's audio is figured out. So we'll, uh, we'll get going uh, with the presentation. So uh, last week we spent a bit of time talking about the changing landscape of education and how open educational resources can play an important part of helping educators create organic teaching environments. We discussed finding authentic language OER by exploring some of the repositories and initiatives where these resources exist. We also discussed what it means to be open by talking about some, uh, well, talking about Creative Commons licenses and what it means to move from all rights reserved to the concept of some rights reserved. Uh, and we finished by discussing the value of sharing. Uh, not only the resources that you create, but also by simply being a champion of open practices. Uh, even if you just sh share links or uh, get a conversation going around OER, uh, you're spreading the word and advancing the movement. So as we get into today's session, we want to again sort of touch on that notion that education is changing. Uh, we're fortunate to live in a digitally rich landscape where there has never before been such a bit ability to access information and never before been so many ways to learn. There are opportunities for students that didn't exist five years ago, and as such, one thing we as educators know that uh, to take advantage of these opportunities presented to our students, the way we teach and the way that we facilitate learning needs to be more responsive. So at its core, uh, teaching is about the interconnection between ideas, people, and resources. And if you ask us here at Coral, we're pretty keen believers in the fact that open educational resources have the power to enhance learning. As a teacher, you have the unique ability to use a wide variety of resources to aid in the teaching of your students. Some of you uh, must follow very specific curriculum. Um, others of you might have significant amount of flexibility to create or adopt activities and resources 
that work for you. But the point that we want to make is that when you use open resources, whether it be open source software, open textbooks, or other open resources, you're taking a significant step in opening up new possibilities for more effective teaching and deeper learning. You might ask why? Well, it's because what we know from talking about OER last week is that, like any resource you might find or create, OER can be used as a standalone resource that you can incorporate into your curriculum without changing. There's not much difference between a non-open resource and an open resource in the way they look, pedagogically or even organizationally. But the major difference is that OERs encourage you to adapt them, to download them, to take them apart, to refashion them and do what you want with them. And why that's important is because as we think about encouraging more effective teaching and deeper learning, we need resources that we can adapt and change to meet the needs of our circumstances and our students' needs. So OER roots itself in that notion that learning happens best in a more organic environment, right? One where students and learners have the opportunity to develop their own solutions by building personalized and contextualized curriculum and by providing multiple ways of mastering a skill or arriving at an outcome. As teachers and educators, I think one of the things that we know quite well is that there's a model of education that we're all too familiar with that doesn't really work that well anymore and it's perhaps a bit uncomfortable to talk about. But it's that linear notion of a factory style approach to education, of getting from point A to point B, right? We know that the world is a vastly different place than it was 20 year, years ago, let alone five years ago, with an entirely different series of challenges, job opportunities, and methods of innovation. Simply expecting students to follow a regimented and standardized series of activities and expecting that that result will be a common point of success is somewhat archaic. If we live in such a drastically different world, shouldn't the ways that we teach accommodate that, or fostering the multiple pathways that one can take to reach a goal and exploring um, basically customization and new explorations. It's important to reiterate just how much we're stressing the uh, open component of this webinar series. There are many great free resources uh, like course tools accessible online or made by someone and simply available for access. Um, there are really some great examples of free materials out there. We saw somebody last week share a lot of them in our, in our chat room. Um, but one of the things that's most important to, to note is that free and open are really different. Free is convenient, right? Free might be a replacement for a costly textbook or prohibitively expensive software, but in the end, free is just a low-cost consumption model. Open means something much deeper than that and deeper than no cost. It's something that's tied to the values of a free culture, which is to say that when you have the freedom to change something, or when you are encouraged to remix, reuse, revise, and redistribute resources that you're part of a creating opportunities for yourselves and for others. So as we move into thinking about the topic of today's webinar, which is adopting, adapting, teaching with, and, and sort of using OER uh, in your context, and as we hear from Amanda, Orlando, and, and Carl, I want to step back and think about what OER offers directly to teachers. Uh, here, I think we would say that OER can offer a pretty great creative spark that generates alternative ideas on how to introduce subjects to students. And even if it's not the resource that you're going to use, uh, it can be a great starting point. And so of the wide variety of OER that's uh, available online, many OER, I guess, and this is our, our point, is to say that OER are easy to adapt and reuse. This means that it can save teachers valuable time. Open educational resources also have the potential to improve quality, raise an individual or an institution's profile, or even just transform the educational process itself. Um, what we also know is that OER are, are an ever-growing part of this educational experience and that in some ways it's an investment in the new educational paradigm. Years ago, foundations got the ball rolling with seed funding, and since then there's been significant institutional and government funding to invest in OER creation and other initiatives. Publishers are also making transitions toward opening their content and where they have a model of sharing their resources and selling their services. So what we know is that we're a part of an environment where access to knowledge is becoming increasingly commonplace. We see content and services being given away all over the web, whether it's 
Google's various free tools, the hundreds of thousands of free apps in the App Store, access to services like Facebook, Twitter, Flickr. Of course, there's also an increased access to online content that's both educational and not, whether we see it with media sources, newspapers and journals, and all sorts of other content. But the argument here is that, well, there, uh, well, content is essential. It's not entirely where the value is. When MIT's uh, open courseware program uh, started, uh, Chuck Fest, the then president of MIT, received a lot of questions about why MIT was giving away its content. He was always asked, wouldn't it dilute the MIT educational experiences, or why would students want to come to the school that has all of its content online? I mean, why would parents want to pay tuition if the classes were free? Uh, and he always responded by quoting one of the faculty members who was a champion of the program by saying that the university education is not a box of books. His thoughts, like many of those uh, of us who support the open content movement, is similar to that, which is give the books away, give the courses away, and give the content away. That the value is calculated by what we do with the content. The value is calculated by putting those pieces together. You might say that the value of education, then, is in the network and the services that can be layered into the materials. It's in the engagement and the interactions and in the information that sits behind and in between the resources. And so while it's true that a significant number of those connections are made on campuses and in workplaces, there's also a great amount of value obtained in enabling connections with others outside the traditional brick and mortar setting. So with that, if there's a message that we have just from this intro, it's to say, get in the game now. It's not a fad or a trend. Be a leader in changing this value system and challenge your colleagues to think about how you can incorporate OER into your teaching how you can spend more time creating, drawing from, and contributing to this community. So before we talk about adapting resources, I want to see if we have any questions. Um, let's wait maybe the chat room. Um, let's just realize now that they can ask questions. Oh, because really? Because we, we didn't have any questions um, until now. Oh, OK. But let's give them maybe a few minutes. Well, I'll maybe we'll go as, as, as we'll go here, and then we'll pause. Maybe pause afterward. All right. So, uh, what I want to start with, then, in terms of talking about adapting resources, is that there's a new wave of OER. It's high quality. It's relevant. It's contextualized and adapted by the pe people like you. Um, not so long ago, it used to be that you had to spend a lot of time searching in order to get good resources. But now there's a whole host of amazing resources available at a click away. Um, as we discussed last week, there are so many packaged and complete OER, not just pieces of content like photos or text snippets, but full-fledged educational materials ready for you to explore. And this includes books. This includes uh, course materials. This includes workbooks, modules, exercises, lessons. We'll hear Orlando talk about some of the stuff that he has. We'll hear Carl talk about some of the resources that we create, but they're available through uh, institutions, they're available through government sources, they're available through individuals sharing them on their, on their own websites. Um, you can find these resources just through common web searches. Um, but new OER is going through this calculated phase of revision, right? It's staying up to date. There's uh, more focus on authentic materials. Um, there's an easier access to a variety, you know, uh, for materials on a variety of devices. And, flexible document formats. Um, so the, basically the point is that the ability to pull apart and repurpose these materials is getting easier and more consistent. So the lesson here is that OER has evolved and it is evolving rapidly. Uh, it's fast changing, it's ready for it to use, and it's ready for you to adapt. So as you do find content, um, basically think how you contextualize this to your content, uh, to basically to your environment, and apply the same standards that you have when you think of incorporating any other resource into your curriculum, which is to say, start by evaluating it, right? Match it with your learner's needs. Uh, you want to align the content with your curriculum standards. Make sure it fits into what you're uh, supposed to be teaching or that your district has sort of talked about teaching. Determine its ease of use and its accessibility. Will it work best in your context as a digital resource? Maybe it's better as a print resource. 
Are the formats open to changing? Can you download it? Um, but again, these are all uh, parts of what OER allow you to do. You want to look for license restrictions. Uh, for example, if you use a photo in something that you create, you want to make sure that you incorporate that just like you decide to work. Um, and most importantly, you want to assess the sort of reputation of the author and the people that are submitting these materials. Not everything's equal. Um, and and some, sometimes this is not great. So definitely take a look at that. And so if you determine that a resource is good for you, uh, you want to find an appropriate editing environment for that, right? Online, there's Google Documents editors, there's YouTube editors, there's TED-Ed, if you're working with video. Uh, there's sites like OER Pub that we talked about last week a bit. Connections, Open Tapestry, Language Box, all these places where you can pretty much drop your content, play with it, reorganize it, and then share it with the world. Uh, one thing you're also going to want to do is, of course, you're going to include, if you're creating content, think about the licenses that you're going to be using. Think about how you want others to use it. Visit creativecommons.org and find out what license makes sense for your, for your use or for your desired use. And then most importantly, and some people sometimes stop here, is that you want to, you want to share that resource. There's no better way to improve the material than by sharing it. If there's one thing that we know quite well, it's that quality drives adoption of resources. And in, in sort of this model of sharing, the best way to, to, to drive the improvement of quality is by finding uh, people to comment and, and change your resource with you, sort of the notion of the wisdom of the crowd. Um, and again, as we've talked about uh, in the previous webinar, but also we'll talk about today, there are so many different places that you can eventually share these materials and then have that experience, whether it's language learning specific or even broader uh, forums like, let's say, uh, SlideShare. But um, some of these resources have the ability also to uh, provide you with comments and people can rate your resource, but more importantly, you can just begin a conversation. So I want to also just sort of finish up here by talking about uh, the fact that there are so many communities out there. We talked about this a bit last week, but uh, growing communities of people who are, who are engaged in talking about OER. And some of these communities exist on Twitter, some exist on Google+. Um, but some of these colleagues also just exist down the hallway. So just talk with folks about what you're working on, what you want to work on, and, and make some of these connections and, and begin building something new. So now I'd like to switch gears. To we, have, questions. we have two questions from the chat room. All right. Um, one was what what the structure of an OER is, or or for creating an OER, mm -hmm. and then the other one is um, what equipment they would need to create OER. Okay. So I mean, to basic response is, and we'll hear probably more about this from talking with our guests. But there there really is no rule. <laughs> There's no one standard. There's no equipment that one needs. Really, the, the, the resource could be paper-based, and you could share it with colleagues in, in a physical environment, or it could be digitally based, and you can upload it to the internet. But um, really, it can be anything from a picture that you take, a drawing that you make, a diagram that you have, to anything as complex or, uh, or as organized as a, as a term paper, or all the way to a lesson plan, uh, PowerPoint presentation. But really, the only thing that's a requirement in this context is that that content that you create is openly licensed and shared. Um, it, it, otherwise, it would just be an educational resource. Can I jump in? Yeah. I, so, hi, Olga. This is Carl Blythe. Um, let me respond to that by saying that uh, I, what Darren was saying, OER is this open category. It can be something really small, like a lesson plan, or something really big, like uh, something similar to a textbook. So it's a huge kind of heterogeneous category, and that's why it can pick any kind of structure. But the main point, as Garen was saying, is that it should be shareable. So you're creating something that is pedagogical value that you're going to share with other learners and other teachers. So we are here to say put an OER, license, a Creative Commons license, which enables sharing. Another thing that I, I think uh, about when you think thinking in terms of the structure of an OER, it's best if you can create it in some format that's editable. In other words, if you create it, if you have a PDF, it's not always easy for people to get in and, and, and change it. The whole point here is to be able to customize, take apart, 
pick apart an, an OER and then adapt it. So a Google Doc, for example, is highly editable. Um, that, that's one of the, I guess, main reactions that I have to this idea of structuring your OER. Mm -hmm. and then the other part of your question was, what type of equipment does an institution need? Well, you know, again, um, how do you write your lesson plans? A lesson plan, if you want to share your lesson plans for a particular thematic unit, you know, what you can use just your own laptop computer and, and Microsoft Word, or PowerPoints can be OER, so it can be very powerful. So you don't need super fancy equipment. Um, just think about what you do right now. You probably produce a lot of content. Think about how you could share that content. Mm -hmm. And then Turin is asking what suggestion, su suggestions we have for this first thing OER. Um, when they use uh, for it is predominantly a closed space, like a class wiki or a blog. Does um, anyone have a thought on that? Well, I can interject. It depends on if you're sharing something which is created as a group and belongs to the group, mm -hmm. or if you're sharing the idea of what you want that group to do. Yeah. Uh, what you're sharing as part of the OER is the idea of you can do this with your students, you can collaborate, mm -hmm. you can use these materials. That's the open part. Mm -hmm. But then you can take that open part and put it within the context of your closed group. So it may be that the rights that you're sharing with the world is the starting point or the materials you have initially, mm -hmm. but then when you put it into practice, you might have a management operating system which controls who actually sees that product. Yeah. So they're kind of two different things. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great response for that. And let me also say to Terrence's question about closed spaces. Um, most people create, most teachers create materials for their classroom. It could be like, a, a, again, a lesson plan or a quiz. Um, so you have in mind typically a, a set of learners, but if you share it with the world, then you let other people decide how they want to use it because chances are that you're creating something that other people can use in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. But by opening it up, you let other people make that decision about how they want to take it apart and adapt it and run with it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. We'll come back to the discussion. I think this is fantastic that we're started here. But I do want to hear from Amanda, who's going to sort of tell us a little bit about her experience using one of the flagship resources of Coral. It's called a Francais Interactif. And I know that I'm probably not um, pronouncing it as well as Close enough. Native French speakers here, but uh, just give me a moment as I as I begin to upload the uh, presentation for you. So while he's feeling that, um, I will just kind of introduce Amanda. She's gathering her thoughts about Francais Interactif. <laughs> uh, Amanda has taught, and she's a, a PhD candidate, a doctoral candidate in French linguistics, and has taught with our materials for a number of years. So I can give the perspective of a developer of the materials, but she then can give the perspective of somebody who is forced to teach with it because she got this, um, like a lot of graduate students in large programs like the University of Texas. People don't always get to make the decisions about adopting the materials. They're simply given the materials. Um, but one of the things that she has done is, of course, since it's an open product, you can keep on playing with it and adapting it. And so, you know, we want her to also talk about what's good, what's bad about an OER. How does it compare to the commercial products? So, Amanda. Yeah, it'll it'll pop up here shortly. Yes. All right. Here we go. Be the controls. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk um, about the structure of the resource that we use here at the University of Texas. And um, it's called Policy Interactive for the sake of keeping this simple. I'm just going to call it FI. Um, it's got two main components here. Um, you see, outline in yellow is the chapter index. That's sort of the contextual part of this resource. So it's got videos and internet activities and things like that. Um, really seeing the language in action. Um, it goes hand in hand with the part that's outlined in orange, which is the text is French grammar. And that's sort of the uh, decontextualized part, if you will. It's the grammatical explanation that has with it its own plot, entry, characters, um, but it's sort of integrated seamlessly with the chapters um, in FI. Yeah. Um, so 
So the features of, I'm um, just going to talk about the first part of the chapter index. The features of FI, um, it's composed of 13 chapters, which... Slow is, down. Olga says for you to slow down and speak more clearly. Oh. <laughs> um, so it has 13 chapters um, that comprise it, and that is the basis for our lower division curriculum here um, at UT. Um, included in that are several chapter PDFs. So Carl was saying that the PDF format tends to make it um, it's another layer in terms of editing. So it's something that um, it's not beyond um, repair. So you can change it, but it's a little harder than um, something like a Google Doc. Um, and these tend to be, they make up the homework exercises, the in-class exercises. Um, internet activities, uh, those are generally uh, built off of online resources like the French train company has a website that we have students use, uh, plan education, et cetera. Um, but we really send them out onto the web um, to do activities that we've created from other resources. Um, in addition, we have chapter read interviews with two groups of um, people. There are second language learners that sort of mirror the students themselves. So they're students at the University of Texas, and they are themselves learning French in the context of this story. And then we also have native speakers um, that are all adults uh, that they listen to. So they get exposure to, to both kinds of groups. Um, video activities generally involve asking these different groups of people questions. Um, depending on the theme of the chapter um, and seeing their responses, the students tend to identify with one, one or the other. Um, one of the particular, I would say, advantages of this uh, OER is that there are phonetics lessons. Um, it seems to be an up and coming thing in second language learning. Um, so this is nice because um, it allows us on a chapterly basis to address some point of the pronunciation of French um, and sort of pull it out on its own and spend time working on it. And so incorporated with that is the, our exercises. And then there's fun stuff, there are song activities, um, uh, cultural activities, et cetera. So on that, uh, we noticed a question from B. Yusuf who asked, the, you know, are OER just digital resources? And I think what you're pointing out there is that they're not. It, you know, French, the FI is actually a book in its context um, that can be printed out, uh, print on demand in color or black and white. But again, the OER does not have to be uh, a digital resource. It's just one of the formats that it can take. That's true. So on the new slide that you see here, if you look at the bottom, um, the PDF, um, should I be this is the PDF for each chapter. And so the students have the option to print it out as the PDF form um, or to actually order a print copy. So they make this decision at the beginning of the semester. And so more traditional learners will just order the book. And I believe it costs like $20 or $30 yeah. at the moment. Um, so they can have the book if they want it, but um, it's always accessible to them so if they want to screw on it, the PDFs are there. I might jump in. I have the book, and as a person who doesn't really speak French, I will go through those big lists of vocabulary, but since I don't speak French, I never know how to say them. <laughs> and so I've got to go and listen to the web page. Yeah. I actually listen to all the vocabulary so I can reinforce, oh yeah, that's spelling, that's yeah. how I'm supposed to say that. Uh, it helps me a lot for that. So this is, I think, as we're going to talk too, I mean, this is one of the advantages of an OER, right? You, you, you can piece together these different components. Those, those pronunciation guides or things like that may have, I mean, they were developed here. But did we, as, well, I have another resource I want to show at the end about the Spanish gentleman at, or the gentleman at Bowdoin University who's created this great resource that links to our resources right. for That's people. It. So it's a, it's, a, it's a website or it's a print text, and then he's... He's linking out to these other pieces that are open, and he couldn't do that if those resources. I do want to yes. ask, say to, again to what you said, his question about does it only mean digital? Most of the time, it is digital. So, like in this, right in French Interactive, you we start with PDF, which is digital, but the point is that you can turn it into print, because our our surveys and most of the surveys that I've read, um, it seems that people are still asking for. Print. print hasn't gone away. It is a very important role for print. But basically what we try to do is give them every format and let them make the choice. So students, if they want to download a PDF to their laptops, that's fine. If they want to order the print-on-demand textbook, that's fine with us. If they just want to, whatever they want to do. You know, we've all had the experience of we prepare a course, there is a book that costs 120 bucks, mm -hmm. and we only want to use one chapter out of that book. And we're faced with the decision, do we force our students to buy a $120 book when we're only going to use a little tiny slice of it? 
This gives us the opportunity to just use the slice we want to use, and somebody else can use a different slice. That's, that's pretty good flexibility that wasn't available before if you only have the option of buying the whole book. That's a very important point. So you don't adopt an OER. There's no adoption model. You don't have to adopt for interactive. You just use materials. So use what you want. So Amanda, structure of a chapter. Yeah, so <laughs> this is the skeletal system, if you will, of each chapter. Um, I've flagged or I've arrowed the, the main components of each chapter just to get an idea of how it's laid out. So um, in the upper left, I'm going to start with the, the table of contents, uh, the introduction, the little link underneath that. Um, this is, excuse me, this is a web page. This is what they see online. Yeah, so um, two slides back. If you follow the link, you can actually click along and see and see this yourself. But yeah, this is online. So this is what they see on the main website. Um, so we start with an introduction video, and this is usually a thematic video. It tends to be partially in English, partially in French, and it just sort of gets the students on board for what they can expect in terms of you know, context and vocabulary, et cetera. Um, underneath it, you have the vocabulary list, and um, that little symbol underneath the title, that little A, that's the PDF symbol. So anywhere you see that little A on this website, um, if you click on it, it corresponds to a PDF exercise uh, that can be used straight away in class. So if anything is printed, it's ready to go, or if you want to alter it for your group, um, someone's just sharing the website. Great, great. <laughs> um, Thank you. You, can, you can do it from there. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about those little subheadings underneath that PDF symbol. This is what Orlando was talking about. Um, so you see we've got sub-themes underneath the list of vocabulary. And what this does is sort the vocabulary for the chapter um, by meaning, if you will. So we have holidays, different expressions, customs, verbs, etc. And so this is where you click, and you can receive, um, there's a little click beyond that, and it will actually pronounce the words for you. So it's not just a traditional vocabulary list where you have the foreign language version and then the tr translation into English. It's also a button where a native speaker is pronouncing it for you. So this is where students can go, um, not that they would do, but <laughs> this is where students can go to um, hear the word pronounced by a native speaker and then practice it on their own. Beneath that is the phonetics lesson. So um, these are the, the, there are usually oral exercises that go with it. Um, there's some sort of linguistic light explanation um, that sort of draws students' attention to some phonetic aspects of the language. Underneath that, you have the grammar. Um, and if you recall on the main site, there were two columns that I pointed your attention to. This is the integration of the grammar. So you've got this whole structure going on, the theme of each chapter, but this is where they interact. So this is where you get the interaction of the story and then the grammar. And so here you have grammar explanations. You can click on either one of any of those numbers, um, you'll get an explanation. And then um, with it, it comes an exercise. And so we're going to look at that later. Um, it's a self grading exercise that the students do on their own time um, and then bring their questions back, back to the class. On the right hand side, now we've got the videos. Um, you'll see that there are uh, different subheadings. So we've got vocabulary and context. This tends to be um, to follow the storyline of the chapter. And so you see you've got PDF activities, um, three different video activities. Beneath it, you have the interviews. So these are the groups of characters that the students get to know. So you have the French speakers at the top, um, and then the UTSN students at the bottom. So each person's name there corresponds to their response um, to the question that's on the left hand side. Uh, beneath that, you have a culture activity. Uh, and this generally sends the students um, to a uh, French television channel station. And so there they have a little four or five minute clip um, that we've integrated for them um, and an activity that accompanies it. Beneath that is an internet activity. Um, this is a greeting card activity. So they're actually sent to a French uh, online greeting card site and then they make their own, their own activity. And beneath that, the song. Um, there's a song for every chapter and I believe they're from, uh, most of them are from TV South. Um, and some of them are just independent. We have another question in the chat room. Um, let's see if we have somebody else answer it. Yes, <laughs> let's uh, carry it. Yeah, um, so the question was um, how this uh, French text complies with the ECFL um, rules and asking if you speak 90% French in the class and does this serve as part of a flipped classroom? Um, yes. And then Karen <laughs> the answered yes. yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, people have been talking about the flipped classroom that's as though it's a recent invention. 
So French Interactive, we've been flipping the classroom for 10 years. So they, they, they go online, they do a lot of this homework that prepares them to do activities. All of the, the content that, that um, Amanda has just enumerated here and talked about, the last step then, of course, is you go back to the class and that the activities are contained in the textbook. So essentially, the, the kinds of materials that you're interacting with the media online is to prepare you for activities that take place in the classroom that are more communicative and more contextualized and require real human beings. And I can give an example from our end. Uh, a number of our Portuguese language materials have a discussion blog that goes with them. When the students write their comments in that discussion blog as part of their assignments before class, now what I do is they work on the assignment at home, they write their comments in the discussion blog, I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, review all the comments they've made in the blog, and then I prepare a lesson for the day in class. So where I used to be the one that prepared what I was going to do in class, now I'm the one that looks at the student comments and based on that, prepare my lesson plan for the day. Uh, you talk about flipping things. Yeah. They are now the ones that are controlling what I'm going to do in class based on their discussion before. Uh, so it's totally changed the way I teach class. Um, real quickly, I want to, Olga raises a good question about, is there, are there similar websites um, in Russian? The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> but we do have a lot of content in Russian, so go to our web, uh, CORA website and you can select according to the languages. We have other kinds of, of content available, but not exactly along the lines of French Interactive. We do have two other sites that are similar. One is in Yoruba, uh, the national language of Nigeria, and the Dojin Blick, the German website. So, and also somebody raises a really good question about um, can you recommend platforms? Um, for those can, not adept at HTML. No, yeah. no, yeah. So uh, essentially, remember, this is just a website. So there's nothing you can just click on these links. There's nothing for you to do. You simply access all the contents. It's 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 available. Well, so his question also bases itself in: Is there a, is there a way to make is a make those resources um, and assemble them uh, using things other than building the website? So and that's and that's in one of the things that we have available, or at least we talked briefly about, is the vast number of sort of repository slash content editing um, websites that exist where you can upload your content, mix it around, mash it up, one of which has been around for about 10 years is called Connections. It's based out of Rice University here in, in Houston, Texas. Um, there's another re, uh, one that's being funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation called OER Pub. Um, for those of you uh, interested in language learning specific resources and, and areas to do that, we talked about Language Box. Uh, that's one that's based out of Great Britain. Uh, so uh, there's also OER Commons, which is a, a resource that you can upload content, draw from others, mash it up. One out of Utah called Open Tapestry. So there's so many different places for you to go. And to if I could add, even in our location, in our own Spanish and Portuguese materials, in our case, there's a link where, for example, if you've made a lesson plan that goes with any of the materials that we have, we welcome you submitting that lesson plan to the website so other people can see what you did with our materials and build on that for the future as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's an easy way to do it. All right, let's, let's continue here from Steph, or excuse me, Amanda. <laughs> so uh, we're going to hustle through the rest of this. Um, I'm going to talk now about the Texas French grammar, and this is the grammar interface that goes with the contextualization. Um, basically, it has its own plot line, it has its own cartoon characters, um, they interact with one another, um, and they have these sound clips that go with them. Um, for each grammatical point, there's an explanation, there are several examples, um, and then there's a text exercise that goes with it, which is a self-reading online activity. Um, what we do here at UT is we have our students do these um, text exercises, and uh, I see here there's a question about spelling and punctuation. Accents count, so they have to um, put, get a 10 out of 10, and then they copy paste them and send them to Blackboard, and that's how you know um, that they've done the activity. So this is what a grammar point looks like. Um, the arrow up shows you an explanation, so this is a obligation. You've got a comment generally that accompanies these. Um, the students tend to like this. 
Um, next to, on the left hand side, you've got a horizontal arrow. There is a little um, audio box. If you click on that, somebody reads to you um, the dialogue that's happening. And then on the right hand side, you have a, a translation of that into English. The text exercise then that the students do to sort of synthesize this material, it looks like this. Um, so generally, they're translation exercises. Um, so you've got some sort of sentence here in sense here in French, and then they've got to um, apply the grammar points of negation in this mm -hmm. sense. They type in the in the empty field. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Here's what they get when they click submit. So they get corrected output, the corrected answer, and then they show them what your answer was. Um, one of the downsides to an activity like this is that the students will enter anything they want, and then they'll just copy paste the correct answers the second time around. So <laughs> they, they found ways around this, but um, if they don't abuse the system, it's a, it's a good way for them to learn down on their own. So um, at UT, um, FI is 13 chapters. Now it's the lower division curriculum, which is two intensive semesters meet every day um, for an hour, 15 minutes, or an hour and 15 minutes. Um, most of the grammar that is included in text, Texas French grammar, is covered. In class time, we tend to do the uh, PDFs, the videos, um, the activities together where there's a lot of interaction. Um, we're still using the communicative classroom. And then the homework, they do a lot of their own exploration in terms of vocabulary, pronunciation, um, watching the videos online. Um, the only main supplement that we're using um, now that's an OER with FI is the CLEAR system that is through Michigan State. And what it is is um, basically a video interface that we use to dispense our oral exams, which we do one per chapter. And they tend to be three to five questions where we record ourselves as instructors asking these questions sort of in a conversational style. And then all of a sudden the students, um, the, the camera starts rolling and the students have to record their own answers. So I've pasted a, an image of what that looks like. Um, you see there's a little window, they see our head talking, and then all of a sudden the camera's on them and they respond. And so this is how we evaluate in a real-time situation. Um, or okay. um, there are also information if you're interested in FI. There's information on the main page, um, the link that I provided earlier on. And there are also lesson plans, exams, there's an exam bank, there are final exams. Um, you register um, there's a teacher. Uh, this little hook thing. You register as a teacher and you can have a, a free account and there you can have access to scripts, lesson plans, syllabi, any sort of teaching materials. This is also the place where you can send your own material if you want it to be included. Cool. Pros and cons of FI. Can, can, I, can you go back? I just want to make one comment and it sure. kind of relates to some things that Orlando does too. So even though, those, even though a lot of these materials are kind of static, um, we don't constantly change everything in the textbook. We do have a pretty active group of people now who are using French Interactive and they extend it in many different ways. So this is an important point. OERs are really, Gary used the word organic. They, they are grown from a community of users and that includes all these different teachers all over the world using this. So the lesson plans and syllabi and scripts, that's all kept fresh and you learn from each other. It's not just using a textbook, it's joining a community. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> my last point here, just some pros and cons of FI. Um, it's cost free. The one thing I like as an instructor at the university is that you don't have that lag time where everybody's going to order the textbook and wait for the textbook to come. Um, the first day in, you give the students the access information, and they're on right away. I mean, they can be on in class the first day. So you can jump right in, and I think that's a huge benefit of it. Um, it's multifaceted. There are tons of different activities with different kinds of learning styles. Um, the scope is really large, so we're not limiting ourselves to just one textbook that's seeking one approach, but we're using the internet, we're using other people's activities. Um, we're sort of sending the students out to find the French that, um, that's meaningful for them. Um, it's also updated regularly um, in terms of there are references that sort of go out of date <laughs> or uh, errors in the activities. It's something that gets taken care of. The only cons that I have as an instructor are that um, the characters that the students meet tend to be, I would say, culturally biased. So for non-traditional students, they don't tend to identify a whole lot with it. Um, largely, the second language speakers of French that they meet are undergraduates, um, and they're usually preparing to study abroad. So I think what ends up happening is they feel a little less identified than they might with, you know, with other characters. But again, being an OER, this is something you can fix by supplementing with, with outside materials. 
Um, also, culturally speaking, the curriculum is really heavily focused on France, um, so it doesn't mention things like Canada or North Africa or um, other places in the world where French is spoken. Um, and so this, I think, is the wrong idea to people for whom this is their first exposure to French. Again, this is something that you can supplement um, to fix. And uh, a follow-up story on that I want to mention. We, uh, a French professor contacted me and she wanted to use French Interactive in Nigeria. So uh, she was teaching French in Nigeria and a couple weeks into the program she realized that, gee, the, this isn't working so well because the whole premise of French Interactive is understanding French culture and language through the subjectivity of American students. And my students are Nigerian. And I said, well, take it apart and try to update it by the, uh, the Nigerian experience. So she basically turned the course around and, it, and she took the premise, the idea, and then flipped it into the Nigerian French Interactive, which is exactly the whole point of OER. Yeah, I think you want to be careful about these are not materials you're supposed to use in a specific way. Mm -hmm. You know, we've just heard how Amanda uses them. But it may very well be that you look at these materials, you take a little piece of it, and you say, you know what, that's going to fit into a current class that I already teach. I can drop this part in right here that way. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be a little cautious about saying, what's the right way to use all this? It, it really is, as an open resource, this is the beauty of it. You get to take it and reshape it for whatever works for you. Um, I noticed that uh, Maria Mayberry asked about, uh, how do I do things by 6 o'clock in the morning? Well, the point really is, if there's a new way for you to interact with students and they can then write in certain blog comments and discussions, comments before I get to class about those materials, that gives me a new way to do things in my classroom. In your case, it may be different. I know in ours, I made the mistake of things being due at midnight. <laughs> students never know, know which day midnight is. Is midnight Thursday or is midnight already Friday? So then I decided that's also wrong because students do all their homework after midnight. And to make something due at midnight was their prime homework time. So I learned I had to make it due 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then when I got up at 6, everything was waiting for me. That's just, a, it works for me, it works for my situation, but you may very well say, oh, I can take these materials, have students do X, Y, Z with it, maybe totally unique. So I want to ask a few questions of you, Orlando, about your, your experience creating OER. When you started creating materials that you knew you were going to incorporate into your classroom or, or just creating teaching materials, did you know that you were going to be creating these as OER, or was it something you stumbled upon one day when you realized, wow? Well, part of the world I live in is I do both Spanish and Portuguese. If you're doing Portuguese, it's a less commonly taught language. There are fewer materials available, and traditional publishing companies are not as anxious to publish things in a less common taught language. So I think a lot of what got me rolling is simply there were not materials available in the less common taught language. Publishers didn't want to go to the expense and the risk of publishing certain things, so we had to find a new way to do it. And everybody who's ever taught a less common taught language, they go to the situation of talking to their peers, talking to their colleagues and finding out what do you use for that class? What do you do for this? What ideas do you have? So really this is a logical extension of anybody who finds themselves teaching a less common taught language with a lack of materials starts trying to figure out how to get materials. And already for 30 years we've been sharing materials back and forth. That's not anything really new for a less common taught language. And so following up on that, one, one thing I want to address too is that a lot of people who begin creating materials sometimes run up against this question of, well, why would you share that material with the world for free when you maybe could have approached a textbook company and made some money off of this? Why, 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 what drove you to simply this, begin giving this content away, openly licensing it? When Let's say, for example, that part of the materials that we created were created from a grant, either from a university or from the government or some other mm -hmm. source. It gets kind of tricky when you say, well, I received money from X source to create these materials, and now I'm the guy that's going to turn them into the book, and I'm the guy that gets paid for it. Mm -hmm. it. It almost seems wrong in some ways, that if the community is what funded the creation of it, then I feel pretty 
happy with the idea of let's share those materials with that same community that actually did it. So, for example, we have created the Congresso Brasileira. It was with the U.S. government grant. That grant was tax money you paid for, so I guess you should have access to the materials once they're created. That's just my mindset on that. Yeah, sure. Can I say about that too, like why do, I mean, I, I get that question a lot. Why share these materials? Why not go with a publishing company? Um, I think it comes down to something really fundamental, and that is the value system of education. I've got nothing against capitalism, but fundamentally to me, education is about sharing knowledge and sharing your ideas. Um, we can publish a journal article. We don't expect to get paid for that. Um, so OER is, a, in, is an infrastructure for sharing scholarship and ideas. And commercial publishing companies don't quite come at it that, that, that way. So I think there is a nice, um, you can build a research component into your, your materials. So uh, for me, it makes sense. I can reach a larger audience with an OER. I can reach un, underserved populations with OER, which is really important. I don't know, to me it just fits with my value system as an educator. And like I mentioned before, you never have to use the whole. You can always just use a part. And that's always put us in a difficult situation of how much should we have our students spend to buy these materials when we don't want to use the whole thing. By having it all as an OER, I really am free to, without any guilty feelings, use a little tiny slice of something yeah. as opposed to the whole package. That's, that's so true. Yeah. And I think also, I mean, I'm talking about the value system, you know, as we talk about um, the crisis in higher education or even in public schools where we don't have the money, the money's drying up, where we are, there is a huge economic benefit to, to people who don't have the money to buy a $200 textbook. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I want to ask is, I mean, you, you're all scholars, you're researchers, you're teachers. Is, if you were going to be going to that traditional route of, of publishing content, you'd be approaching a, a publisher who has resources to provide you feedback to give to you. Was there any, or is there any hesitation as you're creating these materials about sharing them? Like, do you feel you're going to be exposing too much of yourself or your raw ideas, or or that there's this sense of, uh, you know, well, I don't have, it's not together enough, or or do you see that as in some ways an advantage or or a drawback or where do you start with that? You know, we talk about flipping a classroom, but you're also flipping research a little bit, which is it used to be you would produce something, it then goes through a review process, which then gets published for the world to see, because those that reviewed it have said, this is a high enough quality that now the world can see it. So that's the old model. Produce it, have it be reviewed, and then have it be exposed to the world. This is flipping it a little bit. This is saying produce something, get it out there for everybody's use, and then the quality of it gets determined in some ways by how much it gets used and implemented and changed and manipulated by other people. So instead of having it be a review process by people that say this is worthy of the world seeing, now you're kind of switching it around and saying go ahead and see it and then do whatever you want with it to put it into the context of for your own use. So that's a very different, that's a different thing. And we are still in a, an academic environment where you're supposed to do things the old way, be reviewed before it's exposed to the world. So we are doing a little bit different. We're exposing it to the world and then let the world be the review of it as opposed to that academic gatekeeper before. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think, um, so like Orlando's describing the notion of a peer review. Peer review in scholarship is a small group of people. It's a closed system. So open education says, look, there are other people who might want to review these materials. They may not have titles after their names. They may not be a PhD or so forth. But there's a, something called a public review. And that's also important. So public review gives you important feedback right away. And basically, the idea is to open up the entire system to let more people in to, to participate at every level. So to create materials, but also to review materials. And that, you mentioned the, the buzzword, the wisdom of the crowd. That's the whole notion of wikis. And so you collaborate with a lot of people. And I could give you lots of examples of scholars that say, look, you know, open education is also about 
teaching and research kind of folding the two together because you know there are a lot of smart people out there in the world who should be contributing to education not just uh, a small group it really does cloud up the university research and teaching it does yeah they're just mashed mm -hmm. down but but that to me is a is how it should be that the two should go hand in hand when you are creating pedagogical materials every single oer should could have a research agenda that goes with it and that's not something that publishing companies are at this point willing really to to subsidize so, you know we've all had the exact same experience with our with our students that we'll be in a class situation and we're teaching something and our student will do something creative or make a comment or ask a question that causes us to understand things in a new way as well. It, we're doing the very same thing we've always done in the classroom situation, but now the audience is just everybody. So one, one thing I want to ask of Amanda is, is that she, you, know, you came upon FI as a part of what you were sort of supposed to be teaching. Did, was the fact that it was an OER something that struck you as a, as a uh, this is of lesser quality or, or, or what is this you know did you have any prejudgment about what it was or did it change anything in your in your approach to teaching or your your thoughts about about what it meant to teach with that kind of resource um no i didn't really have any uh, preconceived notions of using it earlier, but i thought it was wonderful because using traditional textbooks um, prior to this experience there was a lot of time that we spent trying to integrate it with technology. And so most of our partners teachers were spent making activities to bridge the gap between the world our students exist in, which is online largely, and then this French textbook. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was great. Um, it also, it really demands, um, well, as much preparation time as you want to into it. So if you want it to take five minutes, it can take five minutes. But if you, if you want to create a new activity, then it's something that you can use as a basis for, for something yeah. So, Natalie, did you have a question from the chat room? Or? Um, and we only have a couple minutes left, so. Uh. Well, yes. I mean, there were several questions. Um, I can go over them if you want. Well, to. if there was one in particular that you did. Um, so the the there was a uh, problem raised that um, that a lot of teachers are facing um, about the access and internet access for their students. Mm -hmm. um, this is something we can't solve. But um, we're hoping that foundations and or Google will do their part <laughs> to to solve that problem. In the future. And, and I think you know teachers are really good at, at workarounds and figuring it out. So if there are a lot of teachers tell me they have these kinds of issues about access. So there are some kids who don't have access. So these are the kinds of things that should be brought back to the crowd because other people have been in your situation and other people have figured out uh, a workaround. Um, I, I got to answer Laurel's comment though about how how is F, FI? We've been talking about FI as an OER. How is this an OER? Well, okay, Laurel, you're right in that it's not easy to change a lot of this stuff, but it is an OER in that it carries an open license. You are free to do whatever you want to with, with the, these materials. So that's one of the things. Like Amanda was just talking about, you can spend time uh, changing this. Um, you can use these as templates to create your own kinds of materials, and we, we have a lot of stories like that. I can give an example. We created some materials a few years ago where later somebody in Hungary said, may I make a Hungarian translation of this website? Yeah. And we said, no problem. Go make a Hungarian translation of it. So that to me was a beautiful example of take existing materials and had it had an old-fashioned copyright to it, it would have been very difficult for that person to make that Hungarian translation of those materials. Yeah, and that's just to, to, to note that's the beauty of the Creative Commons license is that it clearly tells you that you have that right to make it a derivative work of it, a translation. And, and we right. encourage you to do it. Exactly. It can be as simple as taking it to Quizlet and making um, Quizlet's uh, flashcards or, or anything else out of vocabulary from the website. All right, so I want to know that we're at four, but I, I do want to just keep going for about five or ten more minutes, if that's all right. I think that there's a great discussion going on here that, for those of you who can stick around, it would be fantastic to have, because um, there is a follow-up question here by Yusuf, the question around, let's say, conflict about revisions and translations, who makes the final decision? Uh, it, exactly, it gets to the question of quality, as, especially as, as, and in this context, you know, you translate a resource into a different language. 
Um, I mean, did, have you, Orlando, found, I mean, I don't, know, I don't suppose you speak Hungarian, you may, <laughs> but uh, how would you feel or how do you feel um, about people taking that content, repurposing it, and may not, may not matching up to what you initially had hoped that it would be either pedagogically or even grammatically? I mean, uh, there was a time when a person created lesson plans to go with some of our online materials, for Congreso Brasileira. I had never made lesson plans to go with those materials. This person also made exercises to go with the materials that were part of our site. I have never made exercises to go with those materials. Even some of the exercises were ones that I personally would never have done, or maybe philosophically don't think those are really good exercises. But that's kind of not the point. The point is the person that used our Converse Brasileira materials had the right to go and change them and use them in a way that she felt comfortable. And furthermore, she is now sharing those with the rest of the world who can also build on that. So if there are revisions and translations and those sort of things, if they're not either the quality or the type or the focus that I want, in some ways it's kind of not the point. The point is that in an old format, that person would not have been allowed to use those materials to change for the way they want to. And if now that person wants to change them in that certain way, no problem. Go ahead and do it. It, it is more messy. But we've used the word organic a lot of times today. And that's because these are living, breathing, moving things, and they keep on changing on us. Right. Uh, but that's kind of the beauty of it, I think. So, uh, yeah, and I, will, I uh, agree with what Orlando is saying. I just want to give, like, use of the example of Wikipedia. So Orlando said it's, it's messy. The process, you can't, you've got to let go of control. If it's going to be open, there are going to be people who are going to see your materials and see all kinds of things in the materials that you hadn't imagined. And that's the, the, the great advantage. But then you've also got to allow people to make their own mistakes. So Wikipedia, you get to see all the messiness of drafts. People will add in things that later get deleted. Um, but eventually, I think it makes for a better product. And it also gets you into a, I don't know, a dialogue with other people. So it is collaborative. And collaboration is also a little messy. So we, we talk a lot about how to uh, deal with this issue of quality control. Um, we want people to kind of take apart our materials and run with them. But at the same time, we also want to maintain the materials for the larger public who may not want to like you know, get in there and, and change them. So, this is a really interesting issue. What do you do with quality and who decides? Mm -hmm. And again, since it's an open environment, we're not the only person who gets to make those final decisions. And one thing that's perhaps interesting to note is that uh, FI itself has a, a significant uh, social media presence. Yeah. So on Facebook, um, I think we have some, you know, 14,000 different likes or I mean a variety of different active users and it's amazing to see how uh, the conversation that's taking place on F, uh, on that Facebook page around FI has moved very differently uh, from what it perhaps was intentionally or set out to, to be. Um, it's a place where people share jokes, share material, share links to different things, and I think that's perhaps one of the, the neat things about it, um, is that it does take its own form, and it, and in, in that you create a new community or create a community that has value to people, um, uh, and, and, and you never know where it's going to go. So like Carl was saying, letting go of that control can, can lead to some amazing uh, amazing opportunities. So on, on that note, one of the things I want to ask Amanda about too is, is, is as somebody who started using OER as a part of her teaching, if, do, you, do you feel like this is something that you're going to be seeking out as you go forward in, in, your, in your next steps? I know that you're, you're venturing into the career territory. Uh, um, is it something that you think you'll bring to your teaching, whether it's FI specifically or, or other resources or other OER? Um, in what ways would you change her? What else would you bring to her? What are, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a flaw to FI like any system, but I can't imagine going back. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I would definitely incorporate it. I think it's got a solid um, sort of basis in terms of grammar, in terms of um, access to the living language um, in within the context of people speaking it, um, and also in redirecting people towards the internet where they can actually see it changing more in real time than the activities that we create. Um, I would supplement it um, probably mostly culturally based um, mm -hmm. in the sense that you know, I think that um, it could stand to have 
a larger scope in terms of where French is spoken, by who, and what our French speakers. Um, but I can absolutely see myself using this in the future. Cool. And I, and I want to just add to that. So Amanda, to me, represents um, something very important because I, when we first started this years ago, I had a lot of graduate students who were saying, I don't like this textbook, and we adopted a textbook, and we're always trying to fix a textbook. And I finally decided, let's just do our own. And it's up to all of us to create something and then take ownership of it. And so Amanda is right, and um, there, are, there are things that could be improved on in F5. And you have the responsibility to improve it, so go with it, run with it. One of the things that I really wanted was to get people over the sense of like everything is in the textbook. The te textbooks should be templates. You see and you, everybody adapts them. So that's so I'm very glad to hear her say this that you know it, it kind of empowers people to to see materials and say to themselves, I can I can do it or I can even do it better. So I think in part of our training here at, at UT at University of Texas, we want to um, not just take a book off the shelf and say teach. But like, take a book off the shelf, look how they did it, and then do it better. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to think about it. So, are there any other? We're going to end here shortly. But are there any final thoughts from anyone here? Uh, I just like I right, buttoned Elson's comment. This is the key. If you want to change it, go ahead and do it. <laughs> well, we've heard a lot of great commentary. I want to thank all of you guys for being here. It's been great to hear uh, your experiences in creating and. and sharing resources and from you and Amanda about your experiences teaching with it and um, the excitement that comes, I think, from this reality that we're, what we are is an opportunity. It's sort of a, a, it's a starting point for many. It's not meant to be, as, as Orlando was talking about, the answer. It's, it's part of, 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 of an answer, let's say. You can begin applying pieces of it to your practice. Uh, and, and, and of course, as the licenses allow uh, for you to begin piecing those out in ways and making things on your own and then sharing them back. Um, I think the, the final point that I'm going to reiterate is that just the, this community is getting so strong and becoming uh, more popular and I think as, as more people like you join it uh, and share your experiences and have these conversations that we're only going to see uh, these resources get better. So uh, with that I want to thank you for uh, attending our second webinar series. We're going to be having a third next week. Uh, it's going to focus on a resource uh, here at uh, that we've developed here at UT Coral Office called Spintex, uh, and we'll be joined by some folks who had a hand in developing that resource. Um, we'll look closely at how you might use that resource as well. It's so in Spanish, tell them it's about. It. <laughs> it's, the session is actually in Spanish. Well, no, it's oh, no. Spintex is this really cool uh, resource for. It's a video archive of, of authentic Spanish. So if you're a Spanish teacher, you particularly want to tune in next time. That's right. All right. Well, uh, if you have any questions, please send an email to info at coral. Uh, uh, well, it's on the title slide, info at coral.utexas.edu, and you can always download the presentation and some of the resources.